All right, welcome back, everybody. Good to see you here once again. Um, why don't we start, as usual, with a prayer, asking God's blessings upon this hour. Dear Father in heaven, we ask the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon us as we read and study your word. We ask that uh, this r- word of salvation and forgiveness will take root in our hearts and uh, will uh, produce much fruit of faith in our lives. We ask for insight and wisdom to understand what it is that you would want us to believe and do with your holy word. And we give you thanks for the opportunity to meet together. Uh, and we, we thank you especially for the freedoms we have in this country to be allowed to worship and meet together around your word publicly. Uh, and we praise your holy name for all of the blessings that you have showered upon us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, we are in the scroll, right? The scroll from the hand of God at the throne has the seven seals, right? And the Lamb is opening those seals one by one. And the first four of the seven seals are these (coughs) riders. The horsemen of the apocalypse is what they're called. The first one we looked at last, we looked at the first one and a half maybe last week, uh, was conquest, right? And then um, we, we sort of got into how do we interpret this, these uh, symbolic figures. Uh, we, we take a look at the evidence that we're given in God's word and then we use God's word to try to understand what is being said here. Um, and so uh, I think that this... Uh, First rider, first horseman is just conquest. It's reflecting what Jesus says about the end times elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, He's saying in the end times there will always be nations and forces bent on conquering others. Uh, And given the context, this seems to be the best interpretation. So, and last week we talked about um, sometimes this is, this horseman is thought to be pestilence because... The idea is conquest and war are the same thing, but they are different things, right? There's a difference between invasion and warfare. Which leads us to the second rider, which we ended on last time. Uh, He had the fiery red horse given power to take away peace and to make people kill each other and given a large sword. Uh, And so it's obvious that this horseman represents war, but that, you know, specifically warfare but more generally, violence as well, bloodshed. Uh, He's generally allowed to take away peace from the earth and make people kill each other. So it's a much wider uh, sort of general fifth commandment type of uh, situation. And the great sword, he is given the great sword, which is a very common image for warfare, a metaphor for war and violence, fighting, quarrels, division, that sort of thing. And this is what Jesus, just sort of like conquest, this is what Jesus predicts for the end times. Uh, there will, both of these are from the same account. Um, there will be wars and rumors of war uh, that Jesus predicts happening. Um, and you know, uh, family even will turn on each other. Uh, this also includes violence, insurrections. Hate, just general hatred and lawlessness. And we had a good discussion last time about how that, you know, the hatred can really get in our hearts and, and affect things in the world and cause and create violence. Um, and it's really only the peace of the gospel that brings true peace to our hearts. I think, I think that's where we ended last time. So I think that we're done with the review and into new territory. So we're continuing talking about war. Note that both the power to take peace and make people kill each other, and also the giant sword, both of these things, the power and the sword, are given to him. They are not his at first. Uh, and this is interesting to note that he, this horseman, or just the idea of war in general, would have no power if God did not give it to him. This is what Jesus says uh, to Pontius Pilate, right? But, you know, and when he's on trial before his crucifixion, um, he says, "You would have no uh, uh, power over me if God did not give it to you." Um, 
w which sort of complicates uh, things a little bit uh, because it sort of raises the question, does this mean that war and violence are gifts of God? If God gives this horseman and gives just sort of general warfare the power to take peace, to make people kill each other with the sword, does that mean that war and violence are g gifts of God? If God has all power, if he's the source of all authority, what happens when earthly authority starts killing each other? <laughs> you know, what does that say about God who gives the power? Another question related to this that's very difficult is, does God cause war and violence? If he is all love, you know, this is a, a common thought. If he is all loving and all powerful, and he allows wars to happen and violence to happen, does that mean he causes war and violence and does not ha or does not have control over it? Yes. He has control, but I'm always thinking he doesn't cause, but he allows. Am I right in that? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so God is not the... Looking to God. Yeah, God is not the direct cause. He does allow things to happen that he did not institute or um, would, you know, that he would condemn as well. And we'll look at, you know, reasons why he might allow some of these horrible things to happen. Yeah, sometimes, to teach us a lesson, yeah. <laughs> we keep repeating our history. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. There, there's nothing new under the sun, says the scripture. Yep. Uh, so we would, we would say that um, war and violence are not gifts of God, right? It's not his intention for his creation to be at war with one another. Uh, the, the, the first example of sin that we are given after the fall is this, right? It's murder. It's Cain murdering his brother Abel. Um, and so this is not what God intends or wants. It's, violence is not a gift of God. Um, this question is a bit more tricky. Does God cause or does he command war and violence? Because we do have parts of Scripture where God commands yeah. to go to war. The Old Testament. Yeah. In the Old Testament, yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. God causing war. Here's different types of Greek swords that would have been around in John's day. Um, God gives power. God is the source of all authority. He gives authority. He gives power. But he does not cause misuse of that power. Right? So he gives the authority to earthly governments and people. But that does not mean he gives them uh, the, the abuse or misuse of that power. So war and violence are not gifts of God, even though they are given, the power is given to this horseman. God allows us free will, which when you have a bunch of sinful people running around, free will complicates things, right? God allows us free will, which we can use to sin, but he by no means causes sin, and he does not desire sin, right? Um, and there's, yeah, there's a number of things we could, uh, explanations we could come up with from Scripture as to why God allows certain things uh, to happen in this world, if he is all-powerful and all-loving. Um, sometimes it might be to teach us a lesson, to humble us. Uh, we might be getting a little too big for our britches. Um, sometimes it might be to uh, help the spread of the gospel in some way. Um, and, and really all, all that happens, uh, or you know, what happens in this world, the reason the world is allowed to continue going on is solely for the spread of the gospel, for the salvation of souls. Uh, that's what it comes down to, really. Um, so God gives authority. Give, and he, uh, Romans 13 is kind of the chapter of the Bible on governing authorities. Um, and it, it says uh, the governing authority is God's servant, um, both to reward 
good, lawful, civic behavior and to punish law-breaking and to punish uh, sin, basically. Uh, but God, because that's the role of earthly government, then um, law-breaking in itself, when you're in that role, is not what God calls you to do to, in that position of authority, right? Um, so even the authorities are beholden to God, who gives all power and authority. Uh, he does not, just because God gave the authority of the office does not mean he approves of the abuse of that authority of that uh, and so, the, one of Jesus' points that he makes elsewhere um, is that those who persist in any, ki- any type of sin, but specifically here, violence, murder, bloodshed, wars, that take away peace rather than ensure peace, um, they will die in sin. Those who persist in keeping on sinning, uh, it becomes open and unrepentant sin. It, it kills and drives away faith from the heart. Um, And this is also where we need to distinguish types of wars as well. What we might call a just war. A war that has a just cause. Um, And and the type of war, which would entail violence and bloodshed and killing, the type of war that would be just is a war that would ensure peace and safety and freedom for other people. Um, And so a war that actually takes away peace or takes away safety or freedom that, uh, you know, is <laughs> pretty questionable. Uh, so G- God does not approve of violence or bloodshed. He says, Jesus says, those who take the sword will perish by the sword. This is sometimes uh, translated as those who live by the sword will die by the sword. That's not exactly accurate. It doesn't mean those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. And this verb uh, has an idea of ongoing, repeated action. Those who make it a habit to take up the sword will die by the sword. And that's sort of, that that is true of just sin in general. Those who make it a habit of sin will die in that sin uh, because it is faith harming and ultimately faith killing. So it is a little complicated um, as far as uh, God giving the, giving the power to take away peace from the earth to this rider, um, to this horseman. But ultimately, we know God is a God of peace, and uh, he does not approve of violence or bloodshed. It's one of the commandments not to do that. So. But sometimes, in order to ensure peace, uh, war is a tragic necessity on earth, and a sinful fall on earth. Uh, okay. Sorry, this is the fine print. I'm sorry if you can't read that. There's a lot of thoughts here. We could do an entire Bible study just on what I'm going to say here. Uh, And if you're interested in that at some other point, we certainly can. This takes us back to when war is commanded by God in the Old Testament. Not in the New Testament at all. Only in the Old Testament. Uh, So here's the fine print. There you go. Now you can see that better, right? Okay. Okay. So, God did command the Israelites to claim the promised land, right? After they were in exodus from Egypt and wandered 40 years, he gave them the authority and the command to claim the promised land. This is a concept of what's called holy war. Yikes, that is a loaded phrase these days, right? Um... And this was called, in the Old Testament, this is called cherem. That's the Hebrew word for it, cherem. This is a very specific idea, and it means devoted to or banned. One of those things. And so the idea is the people of idolatrous nations were devoted over to the hands of the Lord for judgment, righteous judgment. And they were banned from contaminating God's promise of the Messiah that he promised would come into the world to save, you know, pay for all sins, to save sinners eternally, um, that it would happen in this promised land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, So the idolatry of the nations that were in the promised land is devoted over to the Lord for punishment, and the the contamination of um, God's people really following God's law 
for the sake of God's promise of the Messiah, um, they are, the, that contamination is banned from, from influencing them. That's why God consistently always says, have nothing to do with these nations that surround you. Don't follow after their false gods who cannot save you. He has to keep on saying that because they, like us, consistently keep going back to the idols again and again. So, cherem, the idea of being devoted over or banned, it was a one-time command in the Old Testament, in those books, at that time, to take that promised land in that moment, and it reached its fulfillment of the establishment of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, from which uh, would come David's line, King David, right, uh, which is the Messiah. So it's all for the sake of the eternal salvation of the world that God desires. The influence of idolatry and sin and this, those nations, those particularly horrific sins that they committed, um, they could not be allowed to endanger God's plan of salvation. So Cherem was God's, the Lord's mission of salvation. It is not a human, human or national mission of conquering other people, and it's not a human mission of genocide against others. It is the Lord's mission that is a one-time command. We absolutely cannot, uh, you know, go, claim this as a reason for going to war today. Um, the eternal fate of all people throughout all history of the entire world was at stake here. God had to do what was necessary. Uh, and he, we see that when they do conquer the people, God says, do not take even a trace of spoils from them. Don't take a single possession because that might contaminate this promise. We see that with the sin of Achan, I think is how you pronounce it. He was someone where they, they went in, the Israelites went in and they conquered and God said, don't take a single thing. And he took some things and he hid them in his tent. Um, and he was punished for it. He was put to death because he took things that had been, uh, you know, part of idolatrous nations and practices. It had contaminated this promise of the salvation of all people. Okay, so, but, we're going to get through this. But, Pastor Kempfert, you might ask, won't that end the time of grace for all of these nations? If God wants all people to be saved, won't going in and killing all of them end their opportunity to be saved? Yes, it will end their time of grace. But we know from elsewhere in Scripture, and this is not talked about very often, we know from elsewhere in Scripture that God's word had spread to these nations. People had told about what God had done through Israel. I mean, the plagues in Egypt were a big deal. Going through the Red Sea and all of Pharaoh's army being destroyed was a big deal. Word of this went out to all of these nations. These nations had everything that they needed to trust in the one true God. Um, one example of this is uh, Rahab in Jericho. She's a citizen of Jericho. And she says um, she heard reports. People have spoken reports about the work of the Lord. And she believed in him as the one true God. She had faith because she heard the word, the reports of the one true God going out, of all that um, God had done for Israel in Egypt. Uh, she mentioned specifically the Lord saving Israel through the Red Sea, which was 40 years ago by that point. People were still talking about it. Word had spread. Uh, and they were still terrified by it, too. Uh, everything these nations needed to be saved was presented to them in this word of God going out, and they still rejected it in favor of worshiping idols made by human hands. Uh, we see this example when um, the, the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and they bring it back to their place. Um, they put it in alongside uh, their statue of Dagon, which was most likely a fish god, and in the middle of the night, someone, uh, well, God, supernaturally pushes over the statue of Dagon, and so they set it back up, and then he does it again the next night, and the head and the arms of the statue fall off. This is a great account. I really love it. It's so creepy. Uh, it's great. Um, but anyway, so all these, these nations are given in the reports and in sometimes the very Ark of the Covenant of God. They are given everything they need for saving faith, and they still reject it. They go to worshiping <laughs> idols made with human hands. They go to horrendous pagan rituals that included temple prostitution and human sacrifice. 
Uh, these are not good things that are happening. And so uh, now that this com really, really controversial issue and difficult issue has been perfectly cleared up once and for all, we can move on, right? <laughs> it is a very difficult, uh, complicated issue. I don't want to say that it isn't. Uh, I don't want to say it has an easy explanation or solution. Um, but I think it's important to know that we do have scriptural evidence, historical evidence, the word of God went out to all of these nations and they rejected it. And by rejecting it, by continuing these horrible practices, they were actively endangering the salvation of all humanity. Um, that's basically what it boils down to. So God gives Israel this command to go to war and conquer and kill them, um, to devote them over to the judgment of God. Israel is not making a judgment against them here. They are devoting them over to God's righteous judgment, right? Any questions about this? Okay, all right. <laughs> There's a lot more that could be said, too. But, uh, okay, so we are on the, any questions about war, the, the second rider, the second seal, before we move on to the third one. All right, so here we have the third seal. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. All right, so I understand all of the words of that sentence, but I have no idea what it means, right? <laughs> like, it's one of those things where, okay, I get it, but what is going on here? So we're going to talk about what this means. Here's what we do know about the third rider. Rides a black horse. And this is where we get into what the, the colors of the horses mean specifically. Holds a pair of scales in his hand, balancing weight scales. And the scales here measure out food, foodstuffs. Wheat and barley in particular are mentioned. And then a voice assigns a price to those foodstuffs. So a quart of wheat for a day's wages um, and, uh, sorry, maybe, maybe your translation has a quart of wheat for a denarius or something like that. That might be in there. We'll talk about that. A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. So it's assigning a day's wages price to these measurements of foodstuffs, wheat and barley. Very necessary, absolutely necessary foodstuffs that people just had to have. Uh, and what, what we don't realize necessarily in uh, this day and age, looking back at this culture, is the amount of goods that's weighed out and the prices that are assigned to them are very imbalanced. Uh, this is not what these uh, foodstuffs would have cost back then. Um, all right, so this rider is particularly hard for us to understand because we don't use measurements like are what in the original are in the original Greek text we don't use money like a denarius anymore um, and you really need to sort of grasp a particular social and cultural situation that was present in this time in history so let's at first just say nothing about this horseman is good it's a very bad very sad horseman um, makes me want to cry uh, so first the black horse this, is, this translates to today. It's not good. It's not a good sign. Um, for us, black usually means death, uh, and it's connected to death and dying and, and grief. Uh, but in the Bible, the color black has a different uh, meaning behind it. it usually, when it's used, it usually means suffering. Not death, necessarily, but suffering. And often, not always, but often suffering because of God's judgment against somebody. Here's a number of examples where the um, color black is used symbolically to mean suffering. Um, uh, and yeah, there, it's all throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. 
So first we have to realize black symbolically is not a good, a communic does not communicate a good idea, but it, it doesn't mean death necessarily. It means some sort of suffering. Uh, and the kinds of suffering that, it's, that are referred to here include just the general suffering in life, specifically sickness, fever is uh, connected to black, famine, lack of food, and hell itself is called the outer darkness sometimes in scripture. So just complete and utter darkness. All right, so that's the black horse. Second is, uh, are, are the scales that the rider holds. Um, these would have been, you would have put the item or food stuff on one side and then balanced out the weight of the money on the other side to uh, figure out how much the food stuff was worth, how much should be paid for it. Uh, scales measured out amounts of food in the market to determine the price to pay, very similar to what we have today, right? Um, and you know, these scales, they're always just a little bit past zero, right? <laughs> Butcher always has his thumb on the scale, you know. <laughs> uh, but it's the same principle. You put the food in and the amount of weight of the food is the price that you pay for it. One Greek quart that's listed here is uh, about one liter, the volume of one liter. So half of a two liter of, of Coke, you know, it, it, worth of wheat. One denarius is a day's wages, just the, what the average worker could earn in one day of work. And a quart of wheat a day could barely keep one person alive. So the amount of one liter, roughly, of wheat was enough barely to feed one person. So the idea here is you work all day from sunup to sundown, and you earn just enough money to barely feed yourself. Sounds like college. I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> a lot of ramen, a lot of ramen. Um, and then, so there's one quart of wheat that's given one day's wages, but then there's also three quarts of barley. Barley was a lot cheaper to, to grow and produce than wheat. It was sort of the, the poor man's wheat during this time. Barley loaves were really, really just common kind of like street food type stuff. Um, with three quarts of barley could barely keep a small family alive. So someone goes to work and the family works all day and barely has enough money from that day to feed their family. They're just barely squeaking by with what they're doing here. That's the idea behind these. The, the amount of food, the type of food, and then the price. So if, if someone couldn't afford wheat, they would go to barley. The quality of the bread was not nearly as good, but... Um, that, that is what is necessary, basically. Uh, so, this, this, there's an idea here of rationing. You're rationing out certain amounts of food that are very, very expensive. Um, and rationing was, at this time when John was writing this in the Roman Empire, rationing was enforced during times of famine, when food wasn't produced enough to feed all of the people, then the government would ration the food. Uh, actually, we see that even in the Old Testament with Joseph in Egypt, right? Uh, he, he builds up the grain uh, storage bins to uh, bring in all of the food from the seven years of plenty so that way they can ration it out during the seven years of famine. Um, this is not from famine. This is rationing from the war. So, like, this still goes on, you know, in, in living memory. This is from World War II. This was weekly British rations in wartime. Uh, not a whole lot, you see there. Um, and the kind of the biggest thing is the tea, right? That's what you <laughs> absolutely need when you're in Britain. Um, and here is more recently, this is an image of weekly Syrian refugee rations. This is the food that is given to a Syrian family in a, in a refugee camp in 2019 last year to last the week. These get you, I think, like three pounds of rice and flour. Um, but very, you know, rationing, of course, means times are very difficult and it's a very limited supply of food that needs to last everybody. Um, so we still have, the, even though this is sort of a confusing, out-of-date writer, there still are aspects of this we can understand, and that's sort of our entry point into what this writer means. Um, the high prices that are assigned to these goods, this is about eight to ten times the normal price for wheat and barley. Uh, this indicates a very severe famine throughout 
pretty much the whole land, not just locally. Uh, so the idea that's being communicated is there th these very limited supply of food is selling for an enormously high price. Uh, so there has there must be a severe famine throughout the the whole land. Everybody is suffering. Um, and so, I mean, this would be like paying $30 for a gallon of milk today or $60 for one Big Mac meal. If you want a Big Mac meal, you've got to pay 60 bucks for it. This is sort of like you work all day to earn just enough money to feed yourself for that day, and then you start all over the next day. Um, okay, and then we get this very puzzling kind of cryptic phrase at the very end. Uh, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. So we have two more uh, what we might call foodstuffs, oil and wine, both of which also were necessary during this time. Um, wine was, uh, was dr drunk. Drank? I don't know. They drank wine. Uh, my brain's not grammatically inclined at the moment. They drank wine more than they drank water. Because water, you got sick from drinking water, right? But if you fermented uh, water with grapes into wine, then the alcohol killed the germs and the bacteria, right? So they had what was a very weak wine. It was maybe like 2 or 3% alcohol. So it's not like the stronger 15 to 20% alcohol wine that we have today. But wine was just sort of the, the daily drink because water was dangerous to drink. You couldn't always risk it, you know. Um, so wine was sort of a daily necessity for people. They also had stronger, more fortified wine that, you know, when you were, you know, celebrating Bacchus or whatever, you could drink that, but. Um, oh, so yeah, so do not harm the oil and wine is sort of like, I understand what you're saying, but I have no idea what you're saying, right? <laughs> what, what does that mean, do not harm the oil and wine? So this could mean do not waste the oil or the wine. During the famine, they're very precious, so don't waste a single drop of any of it. Or, it could also mean do not harm, do not destroy the oil and the wine because of the economy. Which I realize probably makes no sense. And I still don't think it makes sense in my own brain. But, there's a reason for this. Why, because of the national economy, you might destroy oil and wine. There's a historic event that happened. And so we're going to go to Pastor Kempford's super awesome fun time history lesson of the day. Yeah! <laughs> Learning is fun. All right, in the year A.D. 92, there was a severe scarcity of grains in the Roman Empire. And this combined with an overwhelming supply of grapes. And this led the emperor Diocletian, uh, who was the emperor at the time of the book of the writing of the book of Revelation. He was one of the persecutors of the Christian church. This scarcity of grains and the plentiful grape harvest led Diocletian to destroy half the vineyards. The grains were so scarce and expensive, that, and the, the grapes were so cheap and plentiful, that vineyard owners could not afford to buy the grain they needed. So his solution was to destroy half the vineyards to make the price for grapes go up, and that way, the vineyard owners could get more money and could afford the grains. And uh, so he destroyed half the vineyards. He thought it would balance out the low price of grapes and wine, which was a very important industry at that time, with the very high price of grains. And I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm not an economist, so maybe this makes sense, I guess, but I don't know if I quite understand his reasoning. It did not work, and people got very angry with him because he destroyed half of the vineyards, and it still didn't work. Um, and, and yes, now you know something. Yes, there we go. Uh, <laughs> so this was in very recent memory when John was writing this. So it's possible, do not destroy the oil, or do not harm the oil and wine, is a reference to, don't take this drastic measure to destroy the vineyards to try to uh, make it through this famine because it will just get worse. It won't work and people will get really, really mad at you. Um, uh, so that, that's one thought, that this is maybe a reference to that part. The whole point is this, is, this indicates a famine, a very severe famine throughout the entire land 
that there is no solution to, right? There's no easy way to fix it. Uh, in either case, the third horseman, which is called famine, indicates there will be economic imbalance throughout the world in the end times. This economic imbalance will lead to famine, hunger, and starvation. Just like wars and rumors of wars, this is Jesus warning us of the reality of this fallen world that will always exist as long as this world exists. Yes? Like the fires are doing in California to the vineyards and... Mm -hmm. and yeah, I actually thought of that, um, about uh, vineyards in California being destroyed by fire, too. Um, that that's uh, a natural result of the sinful fallen world that is just ongoing. And uh, here our Lord tells us it will just, it will happen. Um, expect it um, to happen. Um, we know that there will, how do we know that there will always be economic imbalance in the world? We know it from scripture. God tells us. How do we know we can never actually like get the perfect balance of, of class and economy? Well, why is everything always happening to California with the earthquakes and, and the, <laughs> the fires? And That's a question for wiser minds than me to answer. <laughs> it, I don't know. It's weird, though. I mean, I mean, it's such a big land size, maybe. It, it, it has so many different sort of uh, uh, regions, yeah, ecological regions, and covers so much territory that, that would, I have no idea, though. That's my best guess. Um, yeah, we got sinful human beings running the place, uh, in the place, running all over the place, right? Yeah. Uh, yes? Well, Jesus said to the disciples and the people, he said, the poor you will always have with you. Yep. That, yeah, that's where we get the, the, yeah. the scriptural teaching of this, that Jesus says, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me with you, is what he says. So... Um, Jesus himself says there will always be haves and haves not, have nots. That's just an unfortunate result of living in this sinful world with sinful people um, who are in charge of economic decisions that go way over my head. Famine, poverty, and hunger will always be present throughout the world until Christ's return. That's what this horseman is telling us. Um, and it's not giving famine, hunger, and poverty the blessing of God. It's just saying this is the sad reality of the world in which we, we have found ourselves. Um, these are, this is scripture for when Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you. However, the fact that there will always be uh, haves and have-nots, there will always be uh, the poor among us, this is not an excuse to neglect our suffering neighbors, right? Just because there will always be poor people, that's not an excuse not to help out people who need help, just because there will always be people who need help. Um, we still have an obligation to help others. Uh, okay, all right. Eventually, we're in the United States going to have to have some help because we're getting further and further in debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we're giving away an awful lot right now. <laughs> I don't know anything about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> happily, happily oblivious. <laughs> oh. um, all right, any questions about famine? The third horseman. Um, and then, yeah, the one last thing is the, the, the horse is black, which the color of black is associated with suffering in the Bible. So this indicates that because of this famine, there will always be some level of suffering, whether it's economic suffering, food-related, you know, food not being able to uh, put food on the table necessarily. That will always be present there. That answers my question. Okay, Last good. <laughs> um, and we, we, of course, do not trust anything in this world to provide for us, right? We, we trust God, who loves us, gave his son for us to die on the cross, so now... How will he not also freely give us all good things? Um, we, we trust his care and, uh, and his, what's called providence in our life. Uh, okay, uh, so the fourth seal. Uh, Revelation 6, verses 7 through 8. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, 
I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. Maybe your translation says hell followed close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. All right. So here's the fourth horseman riding the pale horse. We know that he's death. He's called outright death. Um, it's a, the, its rider was named death. He rides a pale horse. And we'll talk about what this word pale means. It's very interesting. And Hades follows closely after him. Hades or hell. The, the Greek word here is Hades, which was the Greek idea of afterlife, underworld, hell. Right. And he is given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts. Now, the word that's used for plague is actually just the Greek word for death. Um, so he's given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine, death, and wild beasts. To kill by death, right? There's that great movie, Murder by Death. Has anyone seen that? Fantastic. Anyway, murder mystery comedy. Um, to kill by death. Uh, it's the Greek word for death. Thanatos is the Greek word for death. Um, and so, so sometimes you'll see it translated as plague. Um, I, I don't recall exactly why that's the case, but it's basically to take life either through violence, through famine, through maybe natural death itself, or through something like plague, or black death, that sort of thing. Kind of like what we're going through now with the coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, could be, yep. Um, I still don't want to say that Revelation predicts the coronavirus. Though. I don't want to take that back from last. That was my great, great victory moment, you know, over the internet. Um, so, yeah, the, the Greek word for death is thanatos. Um, this worked when I taught this to my senior youth, my high school age kids. Anyone here a fan of Marvel movies like I am? Thanatos, the Greek word for death, is, becomes the name for the supervillain Thanos. And his plan is not to kill a quarter of the earth, but half of the universe. That's his big master plan. Anyway, it's a, a cool little thing. Like in our culture, we still have Greek words being used. I love it. I love to see that. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so the horse that death rides is pale. This word also means pale green or pale yellow. So it's not necessarily like a pale gray color. Um, the word is chloros, chloros, which is the word for uh, chlorine. Uh, chlorine in its gaseous state is sort of a pale green color. That's where it comes from. Um, so the, the idea is a pale green or yellow. More so than black, this color was associated with death. Because this pale green, pale yellow color is, was the color associated with dead bodies, rotting corpses, basically. Um, it was used in medical texts from this time. Greek doctors used it to describe dead bodies. Um, and we still use it today, this pale green color, you know, for <laughs> zombies are often portrayed as a, a green color. It's the same thing. So this color was what was associated with death. And Hades, the word Hades means hell, um, rather than sort of the general afterlife or the grave. In the Greek language and Greek literature, is this where I am now? Yes, okay. Uh, Hades first was the name of a god, the god of the underworld. There were three brothers. There was Zeus, uh, the god of thunder. There was Poseidon, the god of the sea. And there was Hades, the god of the underworld. Eventually, the name Hades for this god became the name for his underworld as well, Hades. Um, oh, there's Hades from uh, Hercules. Yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can find him there. Um, eventually, Hades meant the underworld itself, and it meant a few different uh, concepts or things in the ancient Greek mind. Um, in the, the literature that we have from this time, Hades can mean just sort of the general afterlife, what happens to you after you're dead, whether it's the good place or the bad place, you know. Um, it could mean the grave, uh, as in just sort of the general realm of the dead, a sort of abstract idea of death. 
Um, or it could mean what we sort of think of today, the place of punishment, the afterlife where one goes to be punished, hell, you know. Um, here's a map of the afterlife, the Greek afterlife, everything they came up with. So there's, uh, this is sort of just the general underworld. Here's the realm of Hades. Uh, uh, there's, over here, there's Elysion. This is like heaven, sort of, where you'd go, the blessed fields. Here, down here, is Tartarus. You do not want to go there. That's the place of, like, for the worst punishment uh, possible. So they had uh, sort of developed and established this very elaborate idea of the afterlife. Hades could mean all of this. It could mean just specifically this sort of place where you go and you just sort of like hang out. You're, you're just sort of a shade or a specter and everyone's just sort of like milling about for eternity. It sounds kind of boring. Um, in, in the Odyssey, the great Greek epic, Odysseus, the hero, goes to this underworld and he's, he talks with his mom there for a time. And that's where he's sort of at like his lowest point in his journey. Um, so Hades can mean a bunch of different stuff in Greek literature. There is a similar word in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, Sheol. And this means all three, in the Old Testament, it can mean all three of these things. Sheol can mean um, just the general afterlife. Uh, oh, I forget who says they're, they're going to Sheol. It's one of the, the patriarchs, I think, mentions that he's going, as he's near death, he's going to Sheol, and he means just, of course, he means heaven because of uh, justified by faith, right? But it's just, the, it's just the life after this one. It can mean the grave, the general realm of the dead. Uh, oh, whoosh. So from the psalm, um, no, I, uh, I don't know if I can say that for sure. But the, this word, Sheol, is used in the psalms to go to the grave, um, to go down into the grave in sorrow or despair. Uh, and it can also mean, Sheol can also mean a place of punishment. It can mean hell. Um, uh, so in, in sort of Greek literature and the culture in pagan Greek writing, Hades can mean all of these things. It's a general word. In the Old Testament, Sheol can mean all of these things. It depends on the context to understand which one it's talking about. In the New Testament, in all of the New Testament scripture, the word Hades does not refer to all of these things. It refers specifically to hell, to punishment. Um, and so the New Testament writers use the word Hades to describe this place of complete uh, separation from God and his love, the place of eternal punishment as a righteous consequence of sin. Um, yes. Which is like, I, I had someone ask why the, what would be the reason for New Testament writers who are writing about this very specific idea to use a word for hell from Greek mythology. You know, people would associate this with this false pagan idea. Um, and our word for hell actually is from pagan mythology too. The word hell is from Norse mythology. It refers to this same place. It was the realm of punishment, the realm of fire. Um, so it, we do the exact same thing today as the New Testament writers did. Uh, we take the word to mean this very specific thing. That doesn't mean that like we, you know, stole the whole idea from the pagans, as some people claim. Um, uh, Alright, so here, here once again the old medieval manuscripts, medieval imagery of, the, of death riding the pale horse and he's dragging hell with him. Um, I love these old images of like hell and demons. They're kind of like these animal faces. They're yeah, really bizarre and uh, interesting. Um, something to notice is if you look at the people who are in hell, it's like all sorts of people from all walks of life. There's monks in there. There's, uh, it's either a bishop or the pope who is in hell, which is like, that was one of the themes of death and hell and punishment of this time was death happens to all people, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a pope or a pauper, um, whether you're young or old, and uh, eternal punishment in hell, you know, that's a, that could hap 
happen to anyone, even someone as holy as a monk, you know? If you put your trust in your own works, you're, you don't have saving faith, right? And that was something Luther talked a lot about, was the monks of his day put all of their faith in their own works, their own righteousness. Um, they thought they were like a lot better than other people just because they went off from society and lived alone in a tower, you know? Um, so yeah, it, it is a very interesting thing, very interesting insight into the time. So he's given power over, are we almost at time? Well, are you going to, we'll stop after the fourth seal? Yeah, I think that'll work. I think, yeah. Uh, so it says, um, death and Hades were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and wild beasts of the earth. So why a fourth of the earth, a quarter of the earth? Um, as with other numbers in Revelation, this is not a literal number. This does not mean literally one quarter of the population of the earth uh, because like what when you know <laughs> the population of the earth when at the time he wrote this at the time the writer is revealed at like there's no specific time or moment of one quarter of the earth at this point in time so this is a symbolic number um, elsewhere this you know uh, these are also symbolic numbers used in Revelation so why one quarter? Well, it's a number that is significant. It's 25% of, the big, you know, of everything, but it's still limited. So death is given power over, death and hell are given power over one quarter of the earth. It's a huge number of people, but it's still limited. There's still limitations placed on it, right? So the point is, there will always be death in the end times. Um, the po and there will always be the threat of hell. Some, some hold that once saved, always saved. Once you have saving faith and you're baptized, you are always saved throughout the rest of your life, no matter what happens. But that is not scriptural. We have examples from scripture of people who had saving faith and then didn't. They were saved, but they denied the faith. And Paul says of two people, they shipwrecked their faith. They had saving faith, but they drove it aground. They lost it. Um, Judas might be one of those, you know, who at one point had saving faith, uh, true faith in Christ, but we all know how that ended, too. Um, so that, the point of this writer is there will always be death. The threat of hell is real, um, and we need to take it seriously. It's not just some fable that we've created to make people behave. Uh, there will always be, death and hell will always be sort of a looming presence in the end times. And it may seem dreadful, it may seem significant and like this huge overwhelming force, but they are still limited and pretty severely limited too. Limited by 75%, right? Um, and elsewhere in scripture, we know Christ holds the keys to both death and Hades, death and hell. He says that at the very beginning of Revelation. Right away in the first chapter, one of the first things he says, I hold the keys to death and hell. I have power over the grave and over hell itself. And Jesus also says elsewhere, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So even though they are given power that seems dreadful, uh, they are completely limited by Christ's power over death and hell. Uh, and and. Through faith in Christ, uh, we have no reason to fear hell, um, and we, we know that we too will conquer death itself. So the, the point of this is, there will, there will, like the other writers, um, there will always be these things present in the end times, but Christ has the victory over all of them. Christ conquered all of them. Um, Christ conquered the sin and the hatred that leads to uh, conquering and war. Um, Christ conquers famine by providing for us in our daily life through his providence. And on the cross, Christ conquered death and sin and Satan itself and uh, opened the gates of heaven to all believers. Uh, we can close just with this. This is a, an altarpiece, and it basically, in visual form, tells the whole story of Scripture. How death and hell came into the world and chased after us and persecuted us and 
stick us with pointy objects because of the fall into sin from Adam and Eve and the tree. Um, and here is the law. The power of the law has no power to solve this or to destroy these foes. The power of the law can only condemn us further by them and drive us. I don't know if you can see it. There, this is hell. There's fires and demons down there. Um, it can only drive us further to hell. But then in the gospel, we have just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness that Israel looked upon to take away the venom of the snakes because of their sin, so the Son of Man must be lifted up to take away the venom of sin and our, you know, our sin and to give us life. And through this sacrifice on the cross, I love it when painters do this. I don't know if you can see this, but the blood of Christ is gushing out of his side and it's falling right onto his heart. And that's like, what a great image of the sacraments, right? The blood of Christ from the cross.